podcast presented by Bless Your Heart Nonprofit Corporation. I'm Ross Jambon, filling in for Brandon Mathern as we speak to some of the most interesting people on Bayou Lafourche. We live in a beautiful area, an area that is often described as picturesque. In this episode, we'll introduce you to Lily Collins Riera, an artist from our community who has a passion for capturing the beauty of our area and whose father captured the spirit of the bayou long before her. Lily, thanks for joining us, and welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, Miss Lily, I've been knowing you forever. Yeah. But can you give our listeners a, a sense of who you are? So, tell us about who's your family, who's your mom and dad, where did you grow up, and who's your kids and stuff? Well, I'm going to say it like I tell everybody. I'm the baby of seven children, born to Freddie Collins and Minta Jeremy Collins. Um, 24 years between the oldest sibling and myself. So she was 24 when I was born. We lived in the best place of Golden Meadow, right behind Randolph's Restaurant, near Dufresne's Bakery and Plays on Snowball, the best place to grow up. (laughs) So five girls, two boys. And what about your kids? Was married for 30 years. I have two children, Roddy, who's uh, got older than me somehow. Um, He's 38. Yeah, he's 38. Oh, passed me up. <laughs> and Jesse, who's 20, uh, 33. Yeah, two children, three grand girls, J- Jillian, Jolie, Gemma. Um, so at the beginning of this podcast, we talked about your dad, Freddie Collins, that he was a, a that he captured the spirit of, of the bayou. Right, right. So he was the at one point he was the only photographer down the bayou for for a while. So tell us about your dad and his artistic side. Okay. Well, by the time I was born, uh, my dad right, retired from being a photographer when I was three. But before that, between Golden Meadow to La Rose, he was the only photographer. He had um, a certain way he did his photography. He had a certain carpet. There was only black and white back then when he started. So he hand colored all his black and whites in wow. two color. Um, so he was known for that. And he was also known for a special carpet he used. Like we can go to somebody's house and see a photo in their wall and say, oh, that's my daddy's because that carpet, you know, it was hand painted. Um, so when I came around at 1963, he retired in 66 uh, and was very bitter about it. He had been in World War II and had been shot in his leg. And so he was disabled from that, but still kept up his business. But um, by that time in 66, his circulation was bad. He had diabetes. So he had to retire. He was forced retirement. Um and he was always bitter about that. And he said, I'll never put another camera in my hand. And he never did. But he put paintbrushes in his hand. So he began um, hand painting just kind of out of his mind. You know, he'd paint ducks. He'd hand carve miniature ducks and fish and make these little um, sceneries and painted a lot of um, live stream uh, fishing, hunting, uh, some things. Each one of us and the older grandchildren have a painting that he's done for us. Um, So he started that. And so I'd sit and watch him and um, maybe I got something from him. So you had told me before that he was, he also carved ducks. He did. He carved miniature ducks. He never did big ones. He never really entered any contests. But we all have these little miniature ducks. He'd hand paint them um, out of balsa wood. He'd sit at the kitchen table. He also made cast nets by hand. He, he hand sewed cast nets. Yeah. So he always had something going on. Yeah. Was he, he, um, he was always a photographer? Yeah. Well, actually, he was a, a, a bar owner before World War II. Before he became a photographer, he was um, had a bar room where um, across from Randolph's restaurant was what we knew as, as the Inferno, mm. which burned, ironically. But that was my dad's uh, bar room right before he went off to the war. And then my mom uh, raised two children and ran the bar while he was in the Army. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, my mama, mommy was a, a bartender. Yeah. We say my oldest brother was born in that bar room. He never came out. <laughs> but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but yeah, he did that. And then he went to Chicago for um, photography school. Um, photography wasn't like now. It would pick up a cell phone and take a picture. It was um, it was schooling. He had to go to school for that in Chicago. And then he opened his business. It was a record shop and a photography business. So my brothers ran the uh, record shop. And he did the photography. My mom played Santa Claus every year. And 
It was before me, but we have pictures. So was that where Sel- Selena's closet was? That no, happened? it was no. actually Inferno was on the other side of the bayou, on the bayou side, across from Randolph's. It burned down when y'all were before y'all were born, probably. Oh, okay. Because okay. I was still a teenager. On the point side. It was on Highway One, but it was on the bayou. On the actual bayou yeah, side. right across the street from Randolph's. So what? What didn't make him? What made him want to be a photographer? I mean, that's not like. I guess you see people taking pictures now, like, to me, that, that was, I think that that would almost be, like, um, alien almost to down yeah. by, you know? Like, yeah. I'm not sure, because, like I said, I was only three was when he retired, and he became so bitter about having to close. He loved photography, and he became so bitter uh, about it. He didn't talk about it much, um, like the war. He didn't mm-hmm. talk about that mm-hmm. much either. He did tell one good story about the war, though. He um, he got shot in his leg, and it went in and out through the other side. And he didn't have to lose his leg, but he said the guy who shot him came up to him, and they made eye contact, and he walked away. Okay. And my daddy always says that the human contact, once they made eye contact, he could not kill my dad. And my dad said it was the best day of his life because he was either going to die or he was going home. And where was he? In Okinawa. Wow. He was in Okinawa. Wow. And that guy walked away. And people don't believe that because they're like, they were not nice people. But he walked away. He must have had something in him that he just could not shoot him. I mean, yeah. a lot of people were thrust into war and didn't want to be in war. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And he left behind two kids and what had three more while he was in the service. And wow. then a whole yeah. slew of them after. So I did, I did see a picture of your dad. Um, you may have posted or somebody posted on Bayou Lafouche memories of him standing behind a camera. His camera, yeah. Yeah, I, I thought that was a pretty cool picture. And that one, the, the colored, if it was the colored one, he actually hand colored that one. And back then it was chalk, like you had to, so he had his own, he would develop his own film mm-hmm. and then he'd take these chalk and just color in, you know, and all those that you see older pictures like that that were black and white, hand colored, he did a lot of those. So, when you're saying chalk, you talking about, like, I've seen pictures that it almost looks like a pastel. Yeah, it type. is. It's a pastel chalk is okay, what he so used. so that's what it is. Yeah, it was wow. a pastel chalk. Yeah, and then when the Broussards came in, um, right about the time my dad had to retire, the Broussards came in, and they did almost all the photography after my dad. So they didn't t- they took yeah, it over. so, and they did a different, you know, they started doing color and all of that. So hmm. he, um, he was out of it by then. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you... You said you were the youngest of seven children. Yes. And you told me before that you had a serious health battle at five years old. So tell us about that and how that uh, played a role in you becoming an artist. Okay. Well, my parents were older. So my mom was 43. My daddy was 45 when I was born. And at five years old, um, my oldest sister, Veronica, who's 16 years older than me, was bathing me and she saw this lump on my side and she meant to tell my parents about it but my grandmother was dying at the time and so it slipped her mind so my grandmother died and a few days later my I started vomiting my mama they took me into St. Anne in Raceland and um they were told there that I had a cancerous tumor on my kidney called Wilms tumor now, this is 1968, so things were different back then. Um, they basically told them she's not going to survive. She, um, you know, we, have, we don't have a cure for this cancer, um, but we're going to send her to two row in New Orleans, and we're going to, this one doctor has seen this type of cancer before. So um, they brought me to two row, and I p- grew up at two row infirmary for the first, I didn't go back to school till second grade. I had just started kindergarten, didn't go back to school till second grade. Um, and back then, they did uh, radiation first to shrink the tumor, had the kidney removed, did chemotherapy, radiation again. And then I did chemotherapy for two years. Mm. And it's a joke in the family that uh, they kept waiting for me to die, and I refused to die. <laughs> so I got a bike when I was 12. But Feel also, love, I huh? know, right? I'm like, Ugh. anyway, that's the story. <laughs> but um, while I was there, so I had to go to school there. When you were well enough, they had a school there. And we did a lot of arts and crafts then um i also have journaled my whole life like probably i have journals from when i was 12 and i still do journaling and blogging and that type of thing but something in me had this artistic thing that i wanted to always be drawing Gemma, my youngest granddaughter same thing always has paper and pencil in her hand um so anyway I, i would not die and my dad said well she can't play contact sports and we don't do that my mama didn't drive so he said 
I'm going to put you in art lessons, in painting lessons with Godlin Serigny, who was well known on the Bayou for her paintings and teaching art. So I did art lessons for probably eight years with Ms. Godlin Serigny, and I learned things that I was a kid, but um, things must have stuck. And then I got, you know, became a nurse. I was a nurse for 34 years. Um, and I really, I did arts and crafts, but I didn't paint as an adult. I never sat down and said, let me paint a picture. Um, but I did crafts. I built doll houses. Um, I raised my family, and I worked as a nurse for those 30-something years. And um, I became divorced after 30, 30 years of marriage. We decided that we were going to be divorced, kind of grew up together, and things just wasn't going to work out as adults. So we um, divorced, and I knew that I had to do – I didn't have to go back to work per se, but I knew that if I wanted to live the lifestyle I wanted to live – I was going to have to find something that I love to do. And I did love nursing, but physically my body just couldn't do it anymore mm-hmm. from all the chemotherapy and radiation. So, so I, that, that long after? I, I have, yeah, long lasting like bone issues mm-hmm. from having the radiation and stuff. But um, I'm good. I'm good now. But it's been a rough time. I'm you sure. know, I wasn't supposed to have children and I was always told I never have children. And I have two beautiful children. I'm so blessed with that. Yeah. But anyway, so, um, b- before we get too far, it, I wanted to ask you this earlier, but um, any other siblings have any art type? No. Interests? No. no. Don't even draw straight lines. No. Nobody does photography. Nothing. I, like, they are career oriented, except for one of my brothers. He, um, no, no art talent at all. And you think that your interest, well, I know you went to uh, like art lessons and all, but I mean, obviously you have an interest in it because... You, I you, think, too, is that I was the youngest, mm-hmm. and so I had more... My dad, we were very... Um, our family was different. My mom worked at Randolph's, and my dad stayed home with the younger kids. So you remember, we had 24 years from the oldest and so the youngest ones. a lot ones. of time with your dad. So I spent a lot of time with my dad and watched him carve these ducks, and if I had a pro, uh, project at school, he would get the posters, and we'd paint. And So I learned a lot from him as well, gotcha. but I don't think it stuck. You know, like um, I don't. It had to be given from him, but mm-hmm. I did watch him do a lot. Like so, I was always watching. So you carve ducks? No, I don't do ducks. <laughs> However, I paint. I could paint one. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't carve them. Yeah. So we had go back to where we were. You had gone through cancer. You right. had this artistic seed planted in you. Um, but you're painting. You did crafts, but your painting really didn't come till later. And it's almost like I was intimidated. Like I thought maybe I could, and I might have. Well, during my, you know, when I was raising my children, sometimes I would think, well, you know, I'm going to get a canvas, I'm going to paint. But I, I was very um, frightened by it, Mm -hmm. very uh, intimidated. I wouldn't. I never liked how it came out. I'd throw it away, or you know. You always your biggest critique. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was very intimidated. And I'll tell you, anybody who's intimidated, just do it because that's how you get rid of it, the the fear. But um, so we went through the divorce and I stayed in Plaquemine because that's where my little grandgirls are. And I didn't really want I didn't think I physically could do nursing anymore. Um, So I was doing arts and crafts. I would sell a little here and there, but I wasn't doing a whole lot. And then I live in the Garden District in Plaquemine now. And one my mom, before she died, gave all us siblings this handmade rosary to thank us for taking care of her. She lived to be 92. And um, we call it the mommy rosary, you know, because all the grandkids call my mama mommy, including you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, so one one day I was just really frustrated about where I was going to go with, you know, my life and stuff. And so I said, I'm going to say a mommy rosary. I'm going to ask mama, tell me what I'm supposed to be doing here. And I swear it's just like this. I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning and I said I was called to paint my neighbor's house. Not my own house, but my neighbor across the street. And so I texted him. His name's Rhett. And I said, hey, Rhett, can I paint your house? And he's like, Lily, my house is brick. And I said, I know. I want to paint a portrait of your home. And he's like, okay, if you want. So I had a floor tile and a 100-year-old newspaper. Had no clue what I was doing. Where you found the newspaper? I I would do um, antiquing and stuff, and I found this old newspaper at an antique store, and I was like, I'm going to do something with that. So that's what I did with it. So I put put it down on this ceramic tile, and I just started sketching and painting, and about a week went by, and 
it's pretty good, I thought. You know, I, I would buy that. My thing is, is that when it gets to the point that I would buy it, then it's finished. And I felt like that was something that I would have bought. So I showed it to Rhett, and he's like, wow, I want to buy that. And I'm like, okay. So I said, can I post it on Facebook? Sure. So that's five years ago, and I uh, have never ran out of homes to, to paint or, or jobs, like commission work. I've paint, painted Double D here in La Rose. I've painted Collins Big Store. People just see my work, and they'll reach out and say, hey, can you do this? You know, I did the Timberlake, Timberlake Bay um, thing churches and I'll do prints of churches and stuff so anyway five years ago that's how it started and I don't really know like sometimes it might sound like I'm bragging but I'm really not bragging I'm really surprised myself sometimes at what I do like I'll paint home portrait now I do home portraits and slate and old music and the whole process I like those pictures the, well, the, the whole pro- and that's a whole process so I'll get like all the history on the house the people who live there um, and then I have probably 2,000 music sheets. And unless they specifically pick out a song, I will pray for it. Like, I'll put a picture. Whoever I'm painting a home portrait for, I put their picture up. And I think about them, and I pray for them. And I only do one home portrait at a time. And then I'll pray about it, and then I'll go through all this music, and I'll just flip and flip. And somehow God leads me to the right song. Mm. And I'll put that song down on slate, and I'll paint that home portrait, and people be like, why did you pick that song? Or why did you pick that piece of jewelry to add? And I'm like, I don't know. And there's usually a story behind it. Really? Yeah, it's crazy how that happens. So but Do you have one that I have, might not be too long that you can you can share with us? Yeah. Um, actually, I'm not going to say his name no, because no, no. I don't have – but a friend of mine who I graduated from uh, high school with, I was walking in Hobby Lobby. Where else does an artist live but in Hobby Lobby? And his name came to my my head. And I'm like, why am I thinking about so-and-so? And And so I texted a friend of mine. And I'm like, you know, I'm thinking about this guy. And he's like, Lily, he died. And I said, he died. And they said, yeah, he, you know, he had a massive MI and he died. I said, well, I think he ordered a home portrait from me. So I go home and I have a list of 35 people. You know, sometimes it takes me nine months to get to a name. So I, I found his name on my list. And so I got in touch with his sister-in-law because I had done some work for her. And I said, he must have put in his order. I've not talked to him on Facebook. She said, well, he doesn't have Facebook. And I'm like, how did I get his name on this thing? So I go back on Facebook. We'll come to find out class of 1981. That's how he got in touch with me on Facebook. He didn't personally have Facebook. So I said to his sister-in-law, I said, well, I feel like I need to paint this house. Like she said, well, that would be so nice. And I'm like, no, I need to do it. Like he's telling me I need to do this for his family. And I want it to be a surprise. So I, I went ahead and, and I could not find a song, could not find a song. So me and a friend of mine went to an antique store and I found a book of music. Mm-hmm. And I got into the truck. This always makes me want to tear up. I got into the truck and I just opened the music book and the song was Say Au Revoir and Not Goodbye. And I said, that's the song. So I went home and I painted the house on that song and it was right before Christmas and um, the, get, told the sister-in-law it's ready and I'm going to bring it and she's like, well, you going to give it to her? I said, no, I'm just the third party. I'm not going to be giving it to them. I said, you're going to do that. So I wrote a card and told her the whole story, and she got back with me after, and she said, we never got to say goodbye. And mm. she says, that's why, because we weren't supposed to say goodbye. We're going to see him later. And so that mm. song meant everything to her. And so when I told a story to her, and she's like, that is wild. I'm like, it's a wild story. But wow. that's God-driven. Mm. I mean, that, I'm just the middleman there, you know. Right, right. But things like that happen all the time. Really? All the time. Um, I always think it's amazing to hear – a story of somebody and you and I had kind of talked about this, but somebody who has like a passion for something and then figures out a way to monetize that passion mm-hmm. so they can do their passion and not quote, I'm doing air quote, quote unquote work. Yeah. It's amazing that I'm, I'm almost jealous. You yeah. Know? And it's funny. I, I told this to my sister a few days ago. Like in the last few weeks, I've talked to several people who who've done that, like stepped out of their comfort zone mm-hmm. and went and did something that, you know, they they just 
it might be mounts, it might be photography, it might be whatever, but they just said, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this and figured out a way to make the money and like he living this stri- not stress free life, but yeah. living this life that they're doing what they love to do. That's all awesome. you just take a you, it's a lamb. You take you take the walk off that lamb. You know, and for me I was in my retire you know, I was right. fortunate to be able to early retire. Um, you know, Ronnie and I had done really well and um he was very we were both very fair in the divorce so I was I had that I don't know if I had the courage to do this when I was in my 30s or something like some people do now but I knew I had that um I could like mm-hmm. I had to tell myself you can do this right, right. prove it to you yeah because I had never painted a home before I had never sketched a house before and now again I'm not bragging it's because it's God driven like there's nothing I don't think that I can paint mm-hmm. So why do you think, so you said you do houses, but you do any other items? Yeah, I do. I, I just started branching on, so I'm not, I tell everybody I'm not a portrait artist. Mm-hmm. And I've had people hit me up for that. And I've done a few. Again, I won't sell it unless it's something I would buy. So I'm just getting to the point where I would say, you know, that maybe I could do a portrait from far. Mm-hmm. But my passion is home portraits, churches. I love a good church. And there's so something about a church. Yeah. yeah, it's something about architecture. But like a church, you know, I'll paint it once and I'll get prints done. And, and people come to pick up prints and they tell you these stories about, yeah, this is what happened to me in this church. Or, you know, one little boy came to pick up his mom's home portrait. It was a, a gift. And, and he's just staring at it. And I'm like, what you thinking? And he's like, well, this is my bedroom. Like, I can walk through this door and I can tell you where my bedroom's at. Wow. Like, he was fascinated by that. And I guess I have a fascination with what happens in buildings, mm-hmm. you know, churches. Like, so I think that's a passion for me. But they, I, they always say, if these walls can talk. Yeah, right. that, and I'm big about that. That's why I love antiques. So um, so tell us what – so you you have, you have a Facebook page yes. called mm-hmm. Mumsy's Cottage. Mumsy's Cottage. Right. My grand girls call me Mumsy, so – the name came about when Jillian was three, I found my, my house in the Garden District. So I was living on in a bigger house, and I didn't want to live there in the Garden District. And so I said, Mumsy's going to come show you where the house I'm going to buy. So we drove up to it, and she said, Mumsy, it's just like the cottage on Goldilocks and the Three Bears. And so I said, Mumsy's Cottage. So they call my house. They don't call it a house. It's the cottage. Mumsy's Cottage. And so I'm like, perfect name for my business. So it's Mumsy's Cottage on Facebook and Instagram. So you have Mumsy's Cottage now. So what do you have any goals or bucket list items that you want to work on? I think everybody has to have goals. Hope, dreams, no matter how old you get. So I just turned 60 this month. Um, and when I'm thinking about my art business, my what I would think would be my prime, my favorite thing, what I would love to do is be a, a live wedding artist painter where you go into these weddings or receptions and you just paint the wedding and the scenery and everybody at the wedding. That would be like a goal of mine. Like that's where I hope to be one day. And I hope I can still walk by then. But um, And then I also would always think that I would like to paint walls, you know, big walls, um, like big people's murals, build, yeah. yeah, murals, like businesses and stuff. But that takes um, big, big money, big pieces, and Wild help, work. and help. Yeah, yeah and yeah. I'm by myself, so I don't. Pay, I wash all my own slate. Like no, I don't hire anybody out. I do all my own work. Sl- slates, scrub slates, cut slates. So, so you did some work on wood. What, what drove yeah. you to that? So, one. Uh, so last Christmas, I had these flower bed things that were uh, planters that were going bad, and so I said. I was going to burn the wood in my fire pit. And I'm like, this is a nice piece of wood. I think I'm going to paint something on it. So I took two out and put all the rest in the in the wood pile to burn. And I sold those two Christmas trees on this old wood. So I got all these orders. So I said, well, I'm going to go pull all this wood out of the, the burning, burning wood. Yeah. Well, now I'm out. So God is amazing. So about four months ago, I was asked to paint some rocks for some children who had passed away in our area. They were doing a, a memorial, and they wanted to give a rock to every parent who had lost a child in our area. And they were like, would you be, you know, we have funds for it. I said, I can't charge you for that. That's going to be a free thing. Again, you do work like that for the Lord, and it always comes back. So I painted these 14 rocks and gave it to them and, you know, didn't go to memorial. I didn't put my name or anything 
from there, people have given me old cypress, hundred year old cypress from a house, oh. shingles. So I'm out of my little file, file pots. So I just, I saw it and I'm like, well, what I'm going to paint? Well, I never did a um, pelican before. Let me paint a pelican. That did look cool though. Yeah. So I painted a pelican and now I have all these pelicans to paint, you know, and I have Christmas trees to paint and I just put it on Facebook and people reach out, you know. Um, I never know what's going to be on a piece. I just look at it and I think, oh, yeah, that's going to be a pelican, you know. <laughs> and then it happens. But like this 100-year-old cypress, oh, my, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. And I can't keep that. That's to give away, you know. Right. So on your way back up the bio, on the LA1 side, somebody just cut a cypress tree. So the you know they, they cut the tree so you can see like the, the, yeah. wood, the wood grain from the bottom. And I saw it the other day. I was like, hmm. You this really needs some, that. <laughs> you can and do something with that. Somebody else lost a, a cypress tree during the storm, and they had to cut it down. And they cut it like in like wood, like you could mm-hmm. build a house with it, you know? Oh, okay. And, and they donated it to me. So Roddy cut it down into smaller pieces. And I do. Um, I also have a fascination with um, cemetery angels. I just love I know it sounds morbid, but I love cemeteries and angels. So on that Cypress, I've been painting cemetery angels just out the blue. And those sell way well, too. I also have a little place in Lutcher that I have my artwork prints in and all. Okay. So it's a little, um, it's called Fairy Landing in Lutcher. And I have prints there and some, a little bit artwork, but mostly my artwork is commission work. I have a list, slew of people that I'm painting for who's waiting for me to paint. So I didn't realize that. I noticed on the when you did the double D drawing, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, when you did the D&D drive-in, <laughs> um, I, I noticed that, that you were selling prints yes. of that drawing. Right. And I didn't, I didn't realize you were selling prints of previous drawings. Yeah. When I do a church, anything mm-hmm. I do on paper, like a church or something, I keep the original and I'll get prints made and i People want it. If somebody went to that church, they want that church. Right. I have like orders. People say, can you paint this church? Can you paint that church? I only want to paint it once. And so I do prints and then I sell prints of it. But Double D, there were a few people who were interested in prints. And the same with Collins Big Store. Um, I did prints of that and, you know, Ray Collins and all. That's all their family. So they all bought prints and stuff. So, But the D&D, they got the original. And I think it's hanging in in the – it's going to be hanging in the restaurant. But, um, yeah. But, you know, people like stuff like that. So, like, we, we had our gala recently, and I was being stupid, obviously, but um, I took a picture of the La Rose Bridge open, you know, for, while a boat's passing. That's a whole other argument right there, whether the bridge is open or Yeah, closed. right, right. Right. And I also took a picture of the seawall that says, lick the fess. <laughs> and we we framed it and we put it out and like one of People them sold it. one of them sold for five hundred dollars the other sold for a hundred dollars. Wow! Now Hiller and Jerry said that it wouldn't have made any money that you know it, ten dollars max. Well, I pr- we proved them. Yeah, right, I did you know? y'all? But I think people like to you know in, in that case they were trying to donate money as well and right. you know, bought it. But I think people like the nostalgia of. Uh, different uh, landmarks around the area, yeah. you know, and are willing to put forward the money because it has those those places have those memories. Exactly. And, you know, no matter, like I live in Plaquemine, it don't matter where I live, I'm from Golden Meadow. Right. And I think people from our area, it doesn't matter where they go. You go and buy you Lafouche Facebook page, you know, everybody's like, oh, well, I moved away 30 buy years Lafouche ago, but I'm from, I'm from Golden Meadow. I'm from... And so, like, when I painted my home church, which go to matter, Our Lady of Prompt Sucker, so many people wanted that. You know, my child was baptized there. And th- you're talking about Golden Meadow, there's not much left in Golden Meadow. Mm-hmm. But it still means something to a lot of people. Like, I've sent that print probably to Florida a few times, you know, and mm-hmm. people all over the United States order sometimes because they've been here. Mm-hmm. Or they, you know, like, maybe a little church, a little Smith Memorial mm-hmm. Church. I did that one. Roddy has that. I took a photograph of that weeks before the, because it was Katrina that tore that one down. And weeks before that, I took a picture and Roddy has it blown up in his house. And I always wanted to paint it. And it was one of the first ones I painted to make prints about. And I can't tell you how far places I've sent this. Really? People just going to Grand Isle. Oh, we stopped there. You know, we put a, a prayer in. It's not there no more. Well, I want to buy it, you know. Um, so I've sold so many prints of that. And it's about the memories. Mm-hmm. If you've been there and you have memories, 
you know, um, like I'm going to do Randolph's restaurant, you know, um, what if Randy have, hears this, that, um, have, that has memories for you. you and exactly. Mom. My mom, we grew up there, you know, but I have an old, uh, Randolph's, uh, menu and I'm going to oh. paint it on the actual menu with their handwriting, changing the prices. Like a steak was two fifty. Wow. Can you imagine? Wow. It was back in the day. But there's can't memories. Even get there. meat for two fifty. I know, right? Wow. You can't even buy a Coca Cola now for two fifty. <laughs> yeah. So anything that has a memory, people want it. You you bring up a very good point about you know, and it's kind of cliche like you you can move away, but it's always in your blood type thing. But we see that very often, especially with, like with bless your heart, be, with people who want to donate. Um, a lot of times. We get donations from people that live in Houston or Pensacola mm-hmm. or wherever. Or if you go on our page, you can on our Facebook page on the backside, you can kind of see where where people are, are from. Or mm-hmm. even with this podcast where people listen, um, you can see what states and towns and stuff. And a lot of times, and it, we saw it a lot after Hurricane Ida with the donations coming mm-hmm. in, a lot of people would message and say, hey, I used to live down by – X amount of years ago, and I was born and raised there. My family's so and so Gidry, but I moved away and I haven't been living there. I see what's going on. I want to send y'all a donation, yeah. you know. And I, I, we said did us at our last gala. Um, there, the reason we were able to get so much supplies to be able to distribute was because of a lady who used to live down the bay and moved away. Mm-hmm. And she got in contact with somebody that got in contact with somebody and said, "Hey, these people need help." give these people a call and we were able to make that connection because right. of somebody that said oh, that's my place uh, right I'm, yeah I, I may not live there but that is my home yeah mm-hmm. I, I it's something unique to hear too because like i can go to baton rouge and run into somebody and they're like well yeah i used to live here but i'm from plaque I and mean, i'm from baton rouge well if they're from the bayou from la rose down they always from that town. Right. Like, I'm from Golden Meadow. Right. 40 years, Golden Meadow. I lived in Galliana, cut off, but I'm from Golden Meadow because everybody right, knows exactly. the family mm-hmm. of the Golden Meadow Collinses. Especially if you open your mouth, then they're like, you definitely from that Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> the accent gives me away, too. Right. <laughs> um, so you, you talked about your artistic side. You you mentioned having a blog and journaling. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about your blog. Yeah. I think writing is also an art an art form. For sure. um, as a young girl, I think I always had a fear that I was going to die and people would not know how much I loved them. It was this big deal for me. I still have writings from when I was eight or nine years old, but I started really journaling at 12. Mm. Um, and throughout my life, I've journaled. And then I came to the realization that in today's generation they're not going to write probably want to read my written word how are they going to know who mumsy was you know so i started a blog probably i have two of them but the one i write now is called little bit of my uh, mumsy's world and i'll just something will spark um, something in me and i'll write a blog you know and that's you know you can find that on on any blog site you share it on your facebook page i do i do um but i had one when i was married was a little bit of my world and that was more when my kids were younger and growing up and then when I became a mumsy I changed it you know my life changed significantly then um I so think yeah I was in a little bit of my world a couple of times you were <laughs> you were yeah a little bit of my world yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so you you went over all the different um you know how what brought you to painting what was the the reasons how what you know what you paint on but what's the one item you think out of all the stuff that you've done so far is like your favorite item? I guess I have that, that love from that first piece, you know, because I, it it started everything. I've done some homes that I fall in love with. Like, Oh my gosh, just, and sometimes it's the smallest one. I painted, um, two house that wasn't even there anymore for these 90 year old sisters. They were It was their house. They were raised in, the house is not there anymore. And I went just from one black and white photo and their memories. And when it came out, they were like, that's exactly what it looked like. You know, to wow. the to the guys, they used to have the big guys things in the yard. And I put all of that in the septic tank and everything. And they're like, that's exactly how it was. So a lot of them have meaning to me. But I always think of that first one, like had I not had the courage to reach out and do that, 
where would I be? You know, two, I've painted 280 homes. I counted it the other day. 280 homes I've painted. Probably have 45 on my list to paint. Hmm. So it's hard to say one, but that first one, you know, it's always going to be special to me. Well, good chance Rhett was there to support you and not to you crazy I woman. I know. <laughs> and Rhett, let me tell you, Rhett, you're going to have to hear this. <laughs> so um, it's time to do our rapid fire questions. So Got it. what what we usually do is we'll I'll ask you the questions. You can answer the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, so feel free to explain if you want to. Okay. It's up to you. Okay, so the first question is, if you have one final meal that you can eat, what would it be? Lima beans and chicken in tomato gravy. My daddy used to cook that all the time, grow the lima beans in the backyard, um, pick them that day, cook it in a tomato sauce with chicken. Now, my my youngest, Jessie, is a chef now. Her and her wife are both chefs. And um, my birthday was last week. Oh, happy birthday. And thank you. And she cooked that for me, just like my daddy used to cook it. So that would be lima beans and chicken would be what I would want. He, he had his own chickens, too? No, we no. didn't have chickens. <laughs> no, he probably got those uh, at Adams uh, somewhere so, down there. So that there. was going to be the follow-up question was uh, who who would cook it? So it would be your daddy. Oh, it would be my daddy. Yeah. But Jesse cooked it, and she did a damn good job. Good. <laughs> oh, yeah, good it was her. just like my dad's. Um, so in the past, we've asked about gumbo and potato salad, whether it, was in, whether it goes in the gumbo or out, out the gumbo. Um, now, I didn't learn this until I moved in with Roddy and started going to Nichols, but uh, white beans – is a thing with jambalaya apparently yeah. of the buyer. Mm-hmm. So white beans, does it go on top of the jambalaya or on the side? Oh, on the top. For sure, for me, on the top. So on I, don't, it. I don't know how I feel. Like, I'm still a red jambalaya, dude. I don't Let know. Let me tell you, people in Plaquemine, there's no red jambalaya. Right. I've never seen such. Th- it's brown, And then it's pasta laya. It's not even like jambalaya. And they'll buy it in a box, and they're like, oh, I'm making a jambalaya. I'm like, that ain't jambalaya. <laughs> That's Zatarans. That's Zatarans, yeah. yeah. But, yeah, I, it's crazy. You I don't, get, get, don't get me wrong. I like I like pasta lot. Somebody, so It's not the same, when we When we were setting up for the gala, uh, we had got a couple of pans of pasta lot, and it was very good. Don't get me wrong. But, they're like, red jambalaya reminds me of my grandfather. Mm-hmm. And he made the best it might not even been good. It might have been just because it was him, but it was shrimp and sausage, yes, red jambalaya. Yes, yeah. And re- we grew up red jambalaya. I didn't have brown jambalaya until I moved to probably Thibodeau. I didn't have brown j- brown jambalaya or white beans on it until I went to Thibodeau. And they were yeah. like, yeah, we're going to make jambalaya and have some white beans on it. Yeah. thinking, like, why? And then but they it's, do it's their good. beans beans in a can. Yeah, but Who it's- does beans in a can? <laughs> yeah. now blue I like runner. Me- I don't like blue runner. I, was- I cook my beans by sh- Honestly, scratch. I like, I like me some blue runner. No, Roddy too. Roddy likes Blue Runner. Um, so the next one, what's your favorite snowball flavor? Um, uh, Plaisance um, Snowballs. Back sure. in the day. Where that's at? It was right by, by where Selena's place was, okay. right next door to Plaisance's. Um, you remember, I don't know, you wouldn't know Charlotte Plaisance and all. But it was, um, it was a black cherry. And it was the best. And so black cherry is still my favorite mm. snowball. So we've had a lot of Missy Lane's. And a lot of groms. Groms. But I... Plaisons was a little bit further down from Randolph's. And it was Brent. walking walking distance. And it's Plaisons, and they were known for their snowballs. It was the grandparents, then the parents, and then the kids ran it. Oh. Yeah, it's going now, though. I love a good snowball. Oh, yeah. See, I'm, I'm a uh, wedding cake. Yeah, y'all fancy snowballs, like, yeah, you know. A, I, Look, I, I, and my I daddy like, used to make us walk to the snowball stand, and you know, when a snowball, all the juice goes when it mm-hmm. gets melted, the juice goes to the bottom. And he'd say, "And don't y'all drink out my snowball." And we'd run home <laughs> with that snowball to so that it would have, and sure enough, it just ice. And he's like, "Who ate my snowball?" And he knew, but we thought he really thinks we're eating a snowball. <laughs> so it was a, it was a thing for us as a kid. Like so, we grew up on snowballs. So what was his flavor? He liked um, strawberry. Strawberry was his favorite. And every day it's you got a, a snowball. Strawberry, strawberry is kind of like a, I guess black cherry. It's kind of like a default. Uh, yeah, I mean that's yeah. what we had, and we yeah. didn't have all these condensed milk uh, yeah. brands, almond, you know. Yeah, yeah um, and wedding cake stuff. No, it was just the fond chalk flavors. Yeah, it was just the name brand ones. Uh, so jar roux, do you ever use it or never use it? Never, never use it. Never. So you make- However, I don't cook a whole lot anymore. Mm. I make my roux from scratch. So yeah. you said Jesse's a chef. She she picked up 
Making she a roux. can make a good roux, but yeah. I'm gonna say she does use jars sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> don't, her, I'm not sure yeah. that, but don't mention her employee. Look, she does weddings. She cooks for oh. 150 wow. people sometimes. So I mean, when it's a big thing like that, like nobody knows what a fricasse is in Plaquemine or Baton Rouge. It's chicken stew. Well, that's right, right. a fricasse. Mm-hmm. But what I'm proud of, Jesse does these pop ups at bar rooms and stuff. And they'll, she'll take, like, recipe my mom had, and she'll just, like, amp it up a bit. Mm. So the day she cooked me the lima beans and chicken, she had to do a pop-up that night, so she cooked enough for there. She called me the next day, and she's like, Papi's lima beans and chicken went over well at the pop-up. I sold out. They want to know where you got that recipe from. She said, Golden Meta. And I'm like, oh, Lord, they don't know where that's at. Right. So, <laughs> so, so it's funny you say that because I'm not going to say the restaurant, but I was I was at a restaurant. And this old guy walked in and everybody kind of went talk to him and they would leave. And like, it seemed like everybody from the kitchen at one point had, had gone talk and talked to him. So when we were leaving, he asked, he said, how was it? I was like, oh, it, it was good, you know. And uh, he he said, oh, I used to own this place. And my son runs it now. I was like, oh, so, you know, small talk, whatever. So I said, yeah, man, the gumbo is amazing over here. I love it. I said, when my grandpa had cancer, every time he would be on his way back from auctioner, he had to stop and he would get his bowl of gumbo, you know? And he was like, yeah, it was my wife's recipe from Galliano. I'm like, aha. <laughs> I knew, knew it that. was good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's a reason it was good. Yeah. And then growing up by Randolph's, you know, that we didn't eat out a lot. My dad cooked every day, homemade bread every day. But every once in a while we would. But a story about Mr. Randolph. So his house was in our backyard. So there, he'd walk to and we'd sleep with our windows open because we didn't have air conditioner. And... I wrote a, a blog about this. Um, every morning at four o'clock, he'd whistle to the to the restaurant, and in my little girl mind, I would say everything's right in the world because Mr. Randolph is whistling. He wouldn't be whistling if it wasn't a good day. So that's how it started every day with Mr. Randolph whistling on his way to to work. Really? So yeah, crazy. Okay, so last question: You're at a down the buyer wedding reception. What is the one song you expect to hear? We haven't. I haven't been to a wedding in so long. So I'm teaching myself how to play the piano. So I'm teaching myself how to play jambalaya, crawfish pie, filet gumbo. I don't know if I ever heard that at a wedding, but that's what came to my mind. So that's what I'm going with. Do you play? You played any other instrument? I played the flute in school, and then I gave that up to be a majorette. And I did not play in high school, but I can still play the flute. But about 15 years ago, I was like, I'm going to take piano lessons. Like, I always wanted to do mm-hmm. something like that. And I did two years of piano lessons as an adult. And then when I bought the cottage, I bought a, I had an old red piano that I put in there. And I ping on it, teaching myself how to play. And then the girls pick, come in and they play a little bit. So Roddy taught them how to play guitar yet? No, I don't think so. He still plays. Though. Yeah, he mm-hmm. plays. He plays, yeah. Roddy, he can sing too, but he don't want nobody to know that. But yeah, he can, he can sing. <laughs> uh, so, Miss Lily, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. I know we've been trying to get this squared away to to get you in here. I'm so glad we were able to finally do that. And I'm so glad it was with you. Yeah, it was I my was first so, time. I know. Yeah. I've just been wonderful. Yep. Uh, so, tell everybody how they can find your art or your blog or just Lily online. Okay. Facebook, Lily Collins Riera. Um, Instagram, I think it's Lily C. Riera, um, or Mumsy's Cottage. And then um, on blogspot.com, it's Little Bit of Mumsy's World. But you can also find that link on my Facebook page. So hit me up if you need some artwork. And if someone wants to buy artwork, they can just message you on one of those platforms. Yeah, most of my work is done through Facebook or private messaging. Somebody knows somebody. And then I do have some artwork in Lutcher at um, Ferry Landing, too. Um, I do prints there and some original artwork. So so that they can message you for customs and prints? Yes. Cool. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so thank much, Ms. Lillard. It's been my pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That'll do it for this episode of the DTB Podcast. This is usually the part where Brandon thanks all of us, but we want to thank him for all the work he has done for this podcast and Bless Your Heart Nonprofit. Also, thank you to the Bless Your Heart team, Sheree Jaro, Hillary Curum, Luke Newman, and Chris Brantley. Please visit blessyourheartnonprofit.com to donate and learn more about our organization. Be sure to follow and subscribe to the DTV podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
You can also get more content by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok at the DTV Podcast. I'm Ross Jomo. Thank you for joining us and see you next time.